Amen. Thank you very much, choir. I appreciate that. That was a beautiful song. I, I caught myself singing this morning as well. I don't know all the words, so when I just don't know the words, I just make some up. Mine were almost as good. So, Turn your Bibles, you will, to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, we're going to begin with verse 18, and we're going to read through chapter 4, verse 1. Uh, as you know, God did not inspire chapter separations and verses and things like that, and it just so happened in this case that uh, the text actually goes through chapter 4, verse 1. So don't think that I'm heretical when I'm trying to read past chapter 4 and uh, include another part. But the Apostle Paul is extending his qualifications from the previous chapter. And the Colossians were under the impression that the gospel they had been taught in the beginning was not as philosophical or as powerful as that of, that of the Colossian uh, in the past. They thought that their faith was lacking. Uh, he reminds the Colossians that they are receivers of the greatest gift of all, and they have the opportunity to clothe themselves in Christ. The gift of the spirit of the virtues that philosophy in the Greek culture was based upon. And God has given them the ability to live what Aristotle and Socrates spoke of. He also is attempting to, see, uh, to get the church to see things practically. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never had a time where I just really, really longed to teach a lesson on a text that tells wives to submit to their husbands. I don't know if some of you guys out there, out there just really love the idea of doing it. I do not. Uh, but my wife has no problem with that, and I don't think many Christian wives do. So it shouldn't be a problem. So if you get mad, just make sure, like uh, Bolivar B. Green says, don't get mad at me, get mad at God, okay? So that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Now, God, the, the reason that God has uh, impressed this upon Paul is because if you don't know already, which I'm sure you do, the family is actually the con most concrete illustration of what God's people are to be. When you look at the nuclear families, it's called a husband, a wife, and children. It's very rare that you see that. Up to upwards of 70% of my teenage youth group, as of a year ago, were lived in, lived in blended homes, single-parent homes, or not even the homes of their parents. 70% of our teenagers at Prospect Baptist Church in Fayetteville, Tennessee in 2013. It just goes to show you that the family is not important in this country anymore. And I think that if we would stop being so scared, myself included, of seeing texts that are so powerful in God's Word, and we would teach them the way they should, this would not have happened. So tonight, I want to just delve into this, this Word, and I want you to understand that the church literally is the, are the called-out ones. We are the ones that are called out of the world. We are to be different from the world because we serve the one who overcame the world. Gene Brooks said this. He writes a blog that's called Sunday in the South that I read every week. He speaks of various Baptist issues. Now, these are Baptist issues, okay? He says that according to his research in his area, which is in the Midwest, 60% of church members in Baptist churches are unregenerate. 60% of church members are lost. Now that is in the Midwest, but I hate to tell you, we have the same problem in the Southeast. We have many churches that are full of church members that have never given their lives to Christ. They've never accepted the blood of Christ to cleanse them from their sin. Why? Because we have made it so easy. Because the gospel is so free, and it is. It is a gift of God. Many churches now, before you become a member, they're actually making you sign a contract. Now, I, don't, I don't like that. I think that's kind of too worldly. But I do think that we kind of lack all, we slack off and think, you know, church membership is just something on a roll. But it's not. It is a privilege. And our privilege is to be, actually be considered part of Prospect Baptist Church, whether you're sitting in the pew doing nothing or you're working every day in ministry. It's your option. But here it says there could be, according to his estimations, could be 10 million Baptist church members on their way to hell. And we wonder why the country is like it is. The church of Jesus Christ needs this personal relationship to, of the family to be a demonstration of the relationship that God wants to have with lost humanity. The advice that Paul gives the Colossian church coincides with his letter to the Ephesians. 
in one of the most hotly debated statements in our Baptist faith and message in 2000, one of the most hotly debated statements even in our convention was the wife submitting to the husband. And we never go any farther than that. So I want to take these next few verses tonight. I want you to compare this. We're not just servants. The, the Greek word for, for servant is dekonos. It's, it's what we get the word deacon. Here he uses the word doulos. It's a slave. Now I know many of us have considered ourselves servants of Christ. But Paul never really uses that language when he speaks of himself. I, Paul, the apostle, a slave of Jesus Christ. It's such a negative connotation unless you are a slave of the Master, our Messiah. There are those here in this text that are listed of lower status as far as wives, children, and slaves, those that are in upper areas of status, husbands, fathers, and masters. And what he's saying is it doesn't make a difference. You're all slaves to Christ. Read with me, if you will. Beginning with chapter 3, Colossians, verse 18, the Word of God declares, Wives, submit to your husband as in fitting unto the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Slaves, obey in everything those that are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart. Fearing the Lord, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done. And there is no partiality. Masters, treat your slaves justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Would you pray with me? Our Father, we're so grateful for this time. We thank you so much uh, for being here with us and help us to uh, open this word and open our hearts and ingrain it into our DNA, Lord, that we are your slaves. Help us to serve you as you have already served us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, first of all, Paul talk, starts off talking about serving immediate families. Now, when talking about immediate families, I, what I consider immediate families is the, the natural um, the, that's really bright. The, <laughs> I feel like I've got a spotlight behind me. The natural nuclear family, the mother, the father, the children. But you know what? In today's society, we have to look even farther than that. You may have a mother and a stepfather and, and all these. You have different family. We have some of, these, some of the kids that we've picked up. They have five or six adults in the house. And they're not all their parents. They may not all be their family. There are so many different ways we can put this. And you could just say, well, you could throw the Bible out and say, well, it's not good for anything anymore. But I hate to tell you, the word immediate covers the whole thing. Those who are in your immediate family, those who are here, and he begins with servant wives. And here we go. Ladies, I ask for your forgiveness before we start this. Can I have it? Amen. I heard some guys say amen. That don't count. <laughs> but look, I've never met a Christian woman, I mean a Christian woman, that had any problem with that. I mean, we, we've talked about it before. We had Sunday school class and we talked down to the youth. And it has no problem. I've never met a Christian woman that has a problem with this verse. You know why? Because it's God. God is teaching them something. And he uses the word wife. It's not woman. It's not woman you need to submit to man. That's not what he's saying. He said, wives, be subject to your husband. Now, this is a present passive imperative. An imperative. You have to do it. But it's the, it is the passive sense. You have to allow it. You have to allow God to work in your heart. I had a lady that actually, I, we, we counseled her, her, I actually counseled her family, and I was counseling her teenager that had um, um, uh, some sort of a disorder, a mental disorder, and I was counseling her, and she said, she said, well, I'm not going to be subject to my husband because he is a rotten person. I said, it didn't say what he is because Christ submitted to every one of us, and we were rotten, and we're still rotten. Now, it doesn't say that you need to allow somebody to beat you or allow somebody to keep you down. But it does say you have a submissive spirit. You allow things to happen. Now, what does this mean? If you go all the way back, all the way back to Genesis 3.16, the, the Hebrew word is teshuka. It means that actually the desire that Eve had. It says, and your desire will be 
for your husband in Genesis 3.16. And that desire is not just a desire for, hey, honey, ain't you good looking? It is a desire to leave. And Eve will have that desire. And here he says, look, worldly people will have a desire to overtake. Godly people do not. Do you realize one of the things that with our um, right to life things, you, know, you see so many good things that are happening with right to life, and then you see bad things happening. We mentioned in Sunday school this morning, there were, there were actually people who were, being, they were actually there for pro-life at a clinic, and they were actually dogging people out as they walk out, of the, out into the clinic, whether they're there for abortions or whatever, they're just dogging them all out. That's not the love of Christ. We talk about the, the bombing in the Atlanta games. You remember that? All these things. Oh, those Christians are just awful. They hate people. You know what? A lot of times they're right. And we've got to watch ourselves. Christ did not do anything but love. He had love. And folks, let me tell you something. When you have the love of Christ, submission is no problem. I don't care who you are. Submission will not be a problem. So why should a woman, a woman should submit? Her husband walked in from working all day. My mouth's getting dry, sorry. A husband walked in from working all day, and his wife had been working all day, and she had started supper, and he, he walks in. He could see that she's really had a rough day, and this was a nice husband. So he walks in and says, Honey, go into the bathroom in there, run you a hot bath. I'm going to feed the kids. I'm going to give them a bath. I'm going to put them in bed. You just go do that, and you can come out and eat dinner later, and you go into bed. I'll clean everything up. Now, you know that wife had to submit to that husband. It's the same thing. It is the same thing, the same idea, whether it's good or bad. And I tell you what, I can find a lot more women will submit in that than in the other. Why? Because it was something that was fitting. It was a, a submission that is fitting in the Lord. Now, that fitting, that word fitting is actually translated that convenient. Literally, it's in the midst or around seeking intimacy. It has an idea of seeking what true intimacy is. One of the things that, that as a husband, we, we want to love, we are to love our wives. We'll talk about that in a minute. But the wife is to submit to her husband. And when she does that, she finds true intimacy. The intimacy we all are, are looking for. So why should a man do the dishes? To find intimacy, right? That's what happens sometimes. Isn't it? Oh, I'll do this and maybe, you know, maybe she'll like me later or something. But to be a servant wife, Paul's language alludes to the fact that they have true intimacy with Christ by denying themselves and submitting to their husbands. I, that's what the Word says. I'm sorry, but that's what God says and that's what it is. Now I'm going to talk to husbands. I can do that because I is one. Husbands, servant husbands, husbands, this is not men. Men don't love other people's wives. I think that's what Paul's actually using. He uses the word for husbands. Love your wife. This is not a passive imperative Guys, this is an active imperative. You better do it. Paul says, love your wives. Doesn't say if they're not mean. Y'all y'all don't have mean wives. Okay, I'm sorry. My wife's not mean. I thought maybe somebody would be. He said, it's, you, don't, you have to actually allow God to help you with this. Where women must allow God to work in them, we have to do the loving. The Ephesians were told to love them like Christ Loved the church and died for it. A love of your wife. And he said, goes on in this text, he says, don't be harsh with them. Don't be harsh. That word is bitter. This word is only used one other place in Revelation when it talks about wormwood. It talks about the bitterness, the poison of the water. Don't be bitter with your wife. Now, this is going on in chapter 3, verse 12, and chapter 3, verse 14. It says that love is all binding. Love of your wife will take care of so many things. Do you know, guys, love covers a multitude of sins? And if not, a dozen roses does. That's what I've been told. I can't afford a dozen roses, but I've been told that works. The Baines, the, the Baines actually did a... a, a a marriage class we, we got to sit most of the time in. And one of the things they said, I think, hit the nail on the head with husbands. Husbands want respect. That's what they want. That's what I want. Respect. Women, wives, want to be loved. 
Now, it doesn't mean that you don't have to love, you know, you don't have to love your husband and husband, you don't have to respect your wife. That's not what it's saying. But God has wired us in a certain way that the husband needs respect and the wife needs love. Husbands, if you want to be a servant, a slave, we have to deny ourselves, put on the mind of Christ, and love our wives like Christ loved the church. And I can give you a little test, guys. If your wife is not so embarrassed about you loving her so much, we probably aren't doing a good enough job. I mean, your love for her almost embarrasses her. If you see that, you're doing a good job. If not, we got work to do. We are to love our wives and do not be bitter. Do not be harsh with them. Then he talks about children. Thank goodness we're getting off adults finally, right? Servant children. He says, children, obey your parents. I could just say amen right now, right, guys? Everybody just say amen. That would be it. But here he says, in everything, obey your parents in everything. This is literally, the word literally, be under the hearing of. And here we go again, a present active imperative. Do it. Now, I like, I like you know, one commentator said, Paul says, obey your parents in everything. It didn't say accept. Obey your parents. When mama says jump off a bridge, yes, ma'am. Doesn't seem right, does it? But it doesn't say anything. They, we take, thing, take things so seriously. Well, if, if your parents tell you to do something that's against the law of God, then you say no. Have you ever been smacked? I've had kids tell me that. I, if I told my mama no, she would smack me. Well, she probably should have smacked you a lot longer time ago, but we'll go past all that. But he says in everything, servant children, though, learn from servant wives and servant husbands. If you aren't doing your job, don't fuss at your kids for not obeying you. That's what he's saying. Think about this. Uh, there's, I have counseled teenagers and I've counseled parents as well. Many are divorced or just plain selfish. The teens will actually have told me before, my dad doesn't really love my wife or doesn't love my mom. And my mom doesn't respect my dad. That's what they tell me. Do you say, wait a minute, you're saying God knew this was going to happen? Absolutely. But here, listen to what it says here. Battlecry.com says 85% of teenagers in America say that their biggest influence in their lives is their parents. 85% say their parents are, is their, their, their biggest influence. A mom who is overbearing and not serving Christ by submitting to her husband, and a husband that does not lavishly, embarrassingly love his wife. Well, why do you have children to disobey? 